Grace to all of you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the service of worship here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. If you are a guest with us this morning, then we want to extend a special welcome to you and thank you for joining your voices to ours in praise and worship. Uh, and we invite you after the service, please stay around, have a cup of coffee, have a bite to eat. Um, introduce yourself to us. Let us know what questions you have about our missions and our ministries here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. If you're joining us over the internet, we thank you as well for joining us as you're able to. And we invite you, if you're ever in the city, if you're ever nearby, please stop by, introduce yourself. Let us know something about you, just as you've learned something about us by watching our service and participating through the live stream. As we prepare to begin our service of worship, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, several of them are printed in the order of worship, if you would look at those, uh, but several of them bear uh, repeating. Um, on the back, you'll see that there is an after church class uh, on forgiveness scheduled for February 5th. That has been postponed uh, to a later date. The reason being is that the calendar was getting crowded at the beginning of February. So if you are a deacon or if you are on the Christian Ed Board, uh, keep an eye on your inbox because a meeting for that Sunday afternoon after church will probably be announced. Second, uh, the morning prayer today uh, is not one that's going to be uh, ex temper. It comes from uh, our hymnal. Uh, it is number 468, the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. I just point that out if at the appropriate time, in case at the appropriate time you would like to uh, flip to it um, and join in that way. Uh, third, Adam. Good morning. Morning. So uh, for anyone who's already spoke to me or anyone who is excited to do so, we're going to be making the bag lunches um, today and after church. Um, this is for the Ecclesiast ministry uh, that Susan does some sermons in the park for, but we're going to help participate a little bit more by giving them food for the individuals at the service. So right after coffee hour, we're going to have a table up front. We have some supplies um, and we're going to just be making some bag lunches for people. So if you're interested, please come up and help us. Also, if you're still cleaning out your closets and you got some stuff you want to put, we're still collecting stuff for uh, the winter coat uh, closet. So help us with that as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Are there any other announcements? Uh, then I have one quick one before we begin. Um, I need to change up a few things in the order of worship. Um, uh, I sent Brian my sermon information on Thursday so that he could get everything proofread and printed. And then I felt compelled to change the, um, the scripture and the sermon um, yesterday. Part of that is because of the uh, extraordinary uh, series of women's marches around this country and around the world. Uh, but also really interestingly, it is because those marches coincided in the series of readings for our Jewish brothers and sisters with the story from Exodus 1 and 2 of the Hebrew midwives and the birth of Moses. And so when those two things come together, you need to pay attention. So the text for today, uh, it's a little bit of a long one. You may want to flip to it when it's time. It is Exodus 1 verse 8 through Exodus 2 verse 10. And uh, the sermon title is Thank God for Unruly Women. <laughs> now, let us begin our time of worship together as we always do by standing and exchanging words and signs of Christ's peace with our neighbors.
worship this morning comes from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Come, my heart says, seek his face, so your face, O Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Our opening hymn this morning is number 464, God of Grace and God of Glory. Let us stand together as we are able and sing hymn number 464.
once again, as we prepare to turn to our Lord in prayer, uh, it seemed right and fitting that this morning we pray the great prayer of St. Francis. Uh, after that, I will open up a time of silent prayer where prayers can be lifted up on hearts, minds, or voices, and then we will close, as we always do, uh, with the Lord's Prayer as printed in our order of worship. If you would bow with me. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Gracious and holy Lord, as we pray with St. Francis of Assisi this prayer that he put down 700 years ago, we ask that you will bind these words to our heart and to our minds. We ask that you will allow them to convict us and to inspire us, not just now as we sit here, not just today or this week, but in all times and in all places. For we know, O oh Lord, that we live in a world that needs love. We live in a world that needs faith and hope and light and joy. We live in a world that needs consolation and understanding and in forgiveness. We know this about our own lives. We know this about the lives of those around us. We know this about the whole wide world. And so in this time of silence, we lift up to you on hearts and minds and lips those cares and concerns that weigh us down, those places in our lives and in our neighborhoods and in our world that need these good graces. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on these and on all places in your creation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will empower us, your church, to be the voices in the wilderness, to be the messengers of your good news, to be apostles sent out into the world to proclaim to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we close this time of prayer with the words that he gave us to offer back to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number 480, I Love to Tell the Story. Let us now stand together as we are able and sing hymn number 480.
be seated. Again, our scripture for today doesn't come from Mark chapter 1. It comes from Exodus chapter 1. I will begin reading at verse 8. And I'll read through chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, it is the story of the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, and the birth of the baby Moses. Now a new Pharaoh arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come and let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from this land. Therefore the Egyptians set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birthing stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she can live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous. And they give birth before the midwife comes. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile. But you can let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. And when she could not hide him anymore, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it amongst the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child he was crying. She took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the 1930s, the American poet T.S. Eliot wrote a play titled Murder in the Cathedral. It's based on the martyrdom of St. Thomas of Becket. It's a really good read. It's a story that I've gone back to a handful of times since I was first introduced to it in college. And when he wrote it, Eliot did something that is both subtle and powerful. All of the actors in the play are men. 
and all of the members of the play's chorus, the, the group that exists as the backdrop of the action, they are all women. In the foreground, on stage, you have men. Men being tempted to do evil by other men. Men fighting other men. Men protecting other men. Men arguing with other men. And then in the background, you have a group of women who never leave the stage. They're always there to respond in unison to the events that are unfolding all around them. All they're allowed to do is to bear witness to all of it, again, in unison, as one, and then suffer the consequences of the men's actions. I think when Eliot wrote this play in 1935, he got it right. I think he recognized that this was the traditional place for women throughout most of human history. In the background, watching, waiting, enduring, suffering. I mean, it's certainly true that in biblical times, women counted as less than men. When the men from Sodom came calling for Lot's two visitors, demanding that they be allowed to violate them, Lot instead brought them in his young daughters. Or think of Esther. Esther, who was in a position to save her people only because she and dozens of other women from around the world at that time had been carried off from her home and forced to join the king's harem because he was tired of all of his other concubines. In other parts of the Bible, the problem isn't that women count for little. It's simply that women are not counted at all. For example, uh, we've been taught growing up, right, that Jesus one time fed 5,000 people with uh, two fishes and five loaves of bread. That's 5,000 men. They didn't count the women and children. If they had counted the women and children, the count would have taken it well over 10,000 almost certainly. But the women weren't important enough to be counted towards the full measure of Jesus' miracle. In the same way that those women in the feeding stories or those women who are taken into the Persian king's harem or those daughters of Lot are not properly valued, neither are the women in the Exodus passage that we just read. There is a new king in town and he is afraid. As the writer of Exodus tells us, he does not know Joseph. He doesn't know how Joseph managed to save all of Egypt during the Great Famine. He doesn't know the good relationship that the kingdom has had with Joseph's family, the Hebrews, ever since. All he knows is that there is a large group of foreigners living within his borders, a group that is large enough, he fears, to undermine his authority if they ever get a mind to. Pharaoh is afraid, and in his fear, he decides to enslave the Hebrews, to try and subdue them through brute force, but he fails. They continue to grow and to grow strong and to grow big, and as they grow, so does Pharaoh's unease. And so he decides to lay the ax to the root to cut off the nation itself, to destroy all of their children, their male children, that is, their future warriors, their future leaders, the only ones who could plot against him, the only ones, or so he thinks, who might undermine his authority. In all of his scheming, Pharaoh has not forgotten about the women. He has simply dismissed them as irrelevant to the task at hand, as completely incapable of threatening his rule. I mean, women are weak, yes? <laughs> women are passive. 
Women are submissive. They are dominated by their fathers and husbands, right? Without a man to lead them, they're hopeless. What could some woman possibly do to threaten the great and mighty Pharaoh? Unfortunately, the Pharaoh in our story today has grossly miscalculated the abilities of the so-called weaker sex. While yes, it remains true that women have often been in the background, it also remains true that women have developed the ability to move around in that background if need be, to exploit whatever they have at hand in order to shape what goes on around them. And if history has taught us anything, ancient history like the story that we just read or recent history like this weekend, it is that women show up and are ready to act when those whom they love are threatened. In this passage, in the midst of the depth and the persecution that hound their people, in the midst of Pharaoh's self-satisfaction, a group of women succeed in confounding every bit of his plot. We have this great big story of this great and powerful man commanding great armies and carrying out murder on a grand scale. And then over here in the corner, dismissed by all of the other players on stage, right in the shadow of his palace, right in his family, in fact, there is a small group of women who, not through force, not through anything but their own cunning and willpower and faith, make all of his schemes for nothing. These women's actions are vital to God's plan of salvation. In saving the baby Moses, they have saved the one who will rise up to lead Israel out of bondage and on to the promised land. They have very literally redeemed the one who will then grow up to redeem Israel. Or, more accurately, let's say God has done this, right? But God has chosen to do this through a group of women that nobody else seems like they want to pay any attention to. In a time when nobody else can, this group of women, this group of shrewd and unruly women fight to save their people and they succeed. And this story is like so many other stories in the history of salvation. Salvation history, the, the work of God in the midst of the life of the world, always seems to reveal itself, as the old song says, in the highways and the hedges. It flares up in some out-of-the-way corner of the world, some backwater place where no one would think to look amongst some of the least likely people. I mean, it's strange, right? Right? We could very well expect that the king of kings would use kings and queens in order to bring about his rule. But he doesn't. We might expect that the most powerful servants of the Most High would prowl the halls of power, would be in places of authority in order that God's work might be done by the most effective and the most efficient, but they aren't. Time and again in the Bible, people miss this point. God doesn't care for power like the world cares for power. God doesn't care about the world's categories. God doesn't see as we see, but looks on the heart and knows where the places are and who the people are through whom his kingdom will erupt. 
And the prophet Samuel looks no further than Saul, a big, strong, powerful, popular man, when he is sent to anoint a king. Well, we know that he should have been out looking in the fields, outside of Bethlehem, trying to find the runty youngest son of a farmer. Centuries later, three magi should have headed to Bethlehem as well. But they thought that they would find the king of the Jews in the palace of the royal family in Jerusalem. But God chose Bethlehem. And God chose Mary, a young woman from a small town with no power and no prestige and no elaborate pedigree, just one more faithful servant. Just one more faithful woman who is willing to say, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will. In the highways and the hedges, these places and people that the rulers of the age ignore, men, women, and children who live and work in the shadows, these are the people whom the Lord chooses to further his kingdom, not the mighty on their golden thrones. And as often as not, and at some of the most critical times, like at the birth of Moses, God picks from those places and chooses from those people faithful and unruly women to advance that kingdom. Rebecca ensuring that the birthright passes to Jacob. Jail, luring Sisera into her tent for a nap. Rahab, hiding the Israelite spies from the Canaanites. Esther, saving the lives of the Babylonian exiles. Mary Magdalene, bearing the body of her Lord to the tomb. And then bearing the good news of the resurrection to the apostles. All of these women, and many more, have borne the weight of the kingdom on their shoulders. And so today, this morning, we as Christians remember and give thanks for the strong women of our salvation history, those women who have been shoved to the margins, but who have in their own way shoved back. Cunningly, clandestinely, faithfully working to see that God's kingdom comes and that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the ushers come forward to receive the offering, now is the time in our service when we are all invited and encouraged to support the ministries and the missions here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church.
Closing him today is number 452, Here I Am, Lord. Let us remain as we are and sing together hymn number 452.
thank you for joining us here this morning. If you are a guest, we thank you especially for joining your voice to ours. Please stay, have a bite to eat, a cup of coffee, introduce yourself to us. Let us know what questions you have about our family and our mission here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church. If you're joining us over the internet, again, thank you for doing that as you're able. If you're ever able to do more, if you're ever able to stop by, if you're in the neighborhood, please introduce yourself to us. We would love to meet you as well. Now, brothers and sisters, as we go forward from this place to love and to serve our Lord, let us do so with this benediction on our minds and in our hearts. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.